Good afternoon and welcome back to the Columbus Metropolitan Club. It is good to see all of you. Uh, I am Mo Wright, Chair of the Board of Trustees and President Raymond Consultant. It's great to uh, have you all here with us today. Today, the Columbus Metropolitan Club is pleased to present Common Sense, brought to us with support from Barbara K. Fergus, as well as TAF, and in partnership with the Ohio Coalition of Common Sense. Please give all of our sponsors a round of applause for their support today. The Ohio Constitution provides that, I quote, the people have the right to bear arms for their defense and security, but standing armies in time of peace are dangerous to liberty. The Ohio Supreme Court held that this provision, and they quote it, secures to every person a fundamental individual right to bear arms for their defense and security. Went on to write, this right is not unlimited, but is subject to the reasonable exercise by municipalities, end quote. It is here the debate begins, and hopefully where common sense will prevail. Unfortunately, due to ongoing rehabilitation, Mrs. Giffords was not able to join us and make the trip to Columbus today. But won't you please join me in welcoming her husband, Captain Mark Kelly, retired U.S. Navy and co-founder for Americans with Responsible Solutions. And our host for today's conversation, uh, no stranger to the CMC stage, we welcome the host of All Sides with Ann Fisher from WSU Public Media, Ann Fisher. Mike, the podium is for you. Thank you, Mo. And thank you, Ann. Mo said common sense will prevail. We can all be hopeful about that and other things. And uh, thanks uh, to all of you for inviting me here today to talk about our nation's gun violence crisis and how our organization, the organization that Gabby Giffords, my wife and I started, called Americans for Responsible Solutions, is working to make Ohio and this country a safer place to live. And we need to do that because, as many of you realize, you know, we live in a relatively unsafe environment we have 25 times the death rate from gun violence than any other industrialized country. Um, it is now more likely, if you are a ch child in this country, to die from gun violence than it is to die in a car accident. And that's a problem. But before we get started, I want to uh, also thank Ted Celeste and the staff at the National Institute for Civil Discourse who are here today and who are, who are doing some important work to bring some much needed civility back to our politics here in Ohio and across the country um, because uh, I think a lot of us would, would agree it's been a rough couple of years on that front. Uh, but one of the reasons that our organization was founded and one of the reasons why we're in Ohio today is the, is the desire for civility and safety and the need for common sense solutions to address challenges facing our communities. Earlier this morning, I visit our, visited your state house, and uh, as you might expect, me being a former astronaut, a guy who's flown in space four times, that Ohio, uh, to any astronaut, even though I'm not from Ohio, I'm from New Jersey, Ohio is kind of an, an important place in our space program, uh, in that John Lovell, Neil Armstrong, and John Glenn are all from Ohio. And for somebody like me, those were my heroes growing up and continue to be my heroes today. And I got to tell you, one of the highlights of my career as an astronaut, uh, first up there with my four space flights, was in 2011 having the opportunity to be there for the 50th anniversary of John Glenn's Friendship 7 flight and being able to sit at a table like this between Neil Armstrong and John Glenn um, was quite incredible for me, and it was only a couple miles from here. But earlier I was over at your state house where I joined a, a group of leaders from across the state of Ohio who want to do more to address gun violence, to address this crisis that is tearing our communities apart, and a crisis that makes our country stand out in the worst of ways. So who are we, this Ohio Coalition for Common Sense that we're in the process of uh, starting? Some of us, like me, are gun owners. 
Some of us are parents. Some are community advocates. Some are former law enforcement officials. Some are veterans. Some are business leaders. And we all agree on one thing, that our country is in the grips of a gun violence crisis, and it's time for our leaders to take some common sense steps to keep guns out of the wrong hands that make our communities less safe. We also all know that here in the United States, we have a strong and proud tradition of responsible gun ownership. In every state across the country, people own guns to protect themselves, for hunting, for target shooting, for collection. I think I personally fall into all four of those categories. And my wife Gabby is a gun owner as well, and so are many Ohioans. And we have the Second Amendment to our Constitution, which establishes our right to own guns in our home for protection, and we respect that. But, but we also have a serious gun violence problem. You know, nationwide, over 36,000 Americans died of gunshot wounds last year. 36,000. And you know what? Over 100,000 more were injured, like my wife Gabby. And that is unacceptable. And since the tragedy at the Sandy Hook Elementary School a little more than four years ago, when six teachers and 20 kindergartners and first graders were murdered in their classrooms, Another 30,000 Americans have been murdered with guns. And Ohio, unfortunately, for all of you, is not immune to this gun violence. And it's violence that really tears some communities apart. From 2001 through 2010, 3,766 people were, were murdered with guns in this state. That's more than the total number of U.S. combat deaths in the Iraq war that's lasted over, well over a decade in that same period of time, 3,766. And this is a crisis that is not only taking innocent lives, it's a crisis that costs Ohio taxpayers and businesses a lot of money. In fact, today, we at Americans for Responsible Solutions released an analysis of newly released data, finding that in 2015 alone, just in 2015, the price tag of gun violence in your state was more than $2.7 billion in directly measurable costs. Those are things like medical expenses, lost wages, and the cost of law enforcement in dealing with this gun violence. 2.7 billion. And when you consider other costs, that number rises very quickly. In fact, that in Ohio, the cost of all this is probably somewhere in excess of $7 billion. Imagine if you could put $7 billion more towards education. What an impact that would have. And it's clear that we have a gun violence problem, and one of the reasons we have such a problem is this. We have, we have loopholes in our laws that let dangerous people have easy, easy access to guns. Under your current laws here in Ohio, and in most states, not just Ohio, felons, domestic abusers, and the dangerously mentally ill have the option of buying a gun without getting a background check. I would guess that probably here in Ohio, as in other states, you got to get a background check to adopt a puppy. And often, felons can get guns without getting a background check. So why do we give them this option? It's really kind of nuts. It makes no sense at all. And you know what? Common sense changes to our laws save lives. We know this is true. The data supports it. Consider this for a second. In the states and in Washington, D.C., that already require background checks for all handgun sales, 47% fewer women are shot to death by their husbands and boyfriends and ex-husbands. 47% fewer. There are also 48% fewer firearm suicides and 48% fewer cops are shot to death with handguns. 
Those are big numbers. But here's what happened. Despite this evidence, and despite even though 90% of Americans supported a bill in Washington, D.C. that would federally close the background check loopholes, it was blocked in the U.S. Senate. This is a bill that was taken to the floor for a vote in the United States Senate after the Sandy Hook Elementary School massacre that would have required a background check for almost every gun sale in the United States of America, a bill that was supported by 90 percent of people. You know, members of the House never even got to vote on this. So there's still work to do, obviously, both federally in Washington, D.C., and also here in Ohio. And if Congress refuses to act to keep us safe, then we've got to do this in the states. And at Americans for Responsible Solutions, we are trying to help. And that's what this new Ohio Coalition for Common Sense is all about. And here's one thing that, that Gabby and I want to make very clear. This is not a fight about the role of guns in our national life or our identity or our culture. I know a lot of you have probably seen this. The, uh, have you seen that bumper sticker that reads, guns don't kill people, people kill people? And the gun lobby says this all the time. And you know what? On that point, I think they're right. It's true. Guns don't kill people. People with guns kill people, usually bad people. And that's exactly why we need our leaders to do everything they can to keep guns out of the hands of dangerous people who want to do our communities harm. The vast majority of Americans agree that Congress needs to close these loopholes. And so do the majority of gun owners. Even the majority of NRA members believe that you should get a, you should get a background check before buying a gun. And what does that number look like in Ohio among just the citizens of, of Ohio? 83%. So 83% of Ohioans believe you should have a background check before buying a gun. You know what 80% of Americans support? You know what gets that kind of support in our country? Almost nothing. In fact, there's two things that get that kind of support. You know what they are? Free money and ice cream. <laughs> and background checks for guns. Right? Seriously, that's about it. So the kind of steps we're talking about are unfortunately only controversial in Washington, D.C. and in some state capitals. But maybe not necessarily here in Ohio. And we're going to see. And it's time to make these changes. You know, one of the gun lobby's top legislative priorities that is moving through Capitol Hill right now is a bill that will ignore states' rights by manda mandating the unrestricted concealed carry of firearms. I don't know how many of you are familiar with this. but well, this is a concealed carry reciprocity bill, and the problem with this policy is that the standards for issuing permits to allow individuals to carry loaded concealed firearms in public vary significantly across the country. And some states have almost no regulations on this. And if this bill was to be passed and signed into law, it would bring the laws of other states to Ohio and here to other places where somebody with little training and no background check can carry a gun on your streets. In fact, 12 states don't even require a permit to carry a loaded, concealed firearm in public spaces. And this would force states with strong laws like Oregon, New Mexico, New York, and California, and even, to some extent, Ohio, to live with weak laws like the state of Florida and Louisiana. This not only endangers public safety, it makes it very difficult for law enforcement to enforce our existing gun laws that are proven to save lives. And the gun lobby is also throwing their weight behind a bill that would roll back an 80-year-old federal law, the National Firearms Act of 1934, that has pre prevented silencers from falling into dangerous hands. You know what silencers are? You know, James Bond used to use one, 007. For those who, who aren't familiar with a gun silencer, they're added to guns to reduce the sound 
of the gunfire and to reduce, reduce the muzzle flash. And they make it very difficult for people who are nearby, including cops, to identify the sound of gunshots and to locate an active shooter. Effective regulation has made silencers extremely difficult for criminals to obtain. <clears throat> but when they have, the results are pretty bad. You remember that this guy named Christopher Dorner, does that ring a bell to anybody? He was the former LAPD officer who had been fired and then subsequently he murdered four people and wounded several others using a gun with a silencer in February of 2013. And then he went, disappeared, and he was really hard to track down. He targeted law enforcement officers in what the Police Foundation described as a bizarre act of vengeance, a gang-style hit on innocent people sitting in a car. And police were initially puzzled as to why no neighbors heard the 14 shots. Well, it was because he was using a silencer. And this federal bill introduced in Washington would ease regulations on gun silencers, making these dangerous devices easier to obtain and if inevitably making them more accessible to felons, domestic abusers, even suspected terrorists. You know, in my experience, pessimism has never solved a single problem. You know, I think data, science, and teamwork solves problems. And we also know that, that as Americans, action does as well. So we as an organization come together to build bridges, to provide some help and hope in times of need. And we come together now to make our country a little bit safer. At least we're trying to. And it's just a matter of time until Congress comes around and acts. You know, we are a country that solves problems, right? I had somebody say to me recently, a really smart person, that said this problem was unsolvable. We will never do better than having 25 times the death rate of gun violence than any other industrialized country. We can't fix this. And I was like, come on. I mean, we sent people to the moon in the 1960s. I mean, just think about that. We can solve hard problems here. We've had harder problems to solve than just this. And it's, not, it's just a matter of time before Congress does act on this. But until then, we need to fix this here in Ohio, in Columbus. And we're optimistic that we can do that. We're optimistic that we can all do a lot better. And we really have to do better. So to all of you here today, I just want to say thank you. You know, thanks for coming out and listening to me. And I'll be very happy to take all of your questions. They can even be about space. Thank you. Okay, so everybody agree, not everybody, 83% of Americans agree that they should close the background check loophole. It's everybody agree, you know, besides free money and ice cream, you know, that's it. All right, but how many of those people care enough to vote? They're saying it's not something that drives people to the voting booth, it's not something that drives them you know, on, on ballot initiatives. Uh, it's the, the folks who support increasing gun rights, closing the, or uh, opening up loopholes if you want, or, or on the other side of the coin, they're much more motivated. Yeah, it's one of the problems we deal with. We like to call it the enthusiasm gap. You know, the gun rights people, guys that own a lot of guns, you know, and really pay a lot of attention to this are incredibly enthusiastic about it. And they tend to vote only on this issue. People on the other side, you know, that want to make our community safer from gun violence, they also tend to care about the environment. They might care about health care. So they, they don't tend to vote just on this issue. So that is an uphill battle that we deal with. So you have a lot of enthusiasm on the other side by a minority of Americans, but they're very vocal and very enthusiastic. So we're trying to mobilize this other the other 90%, or here in Ohio, 83%, or in my state of Arizona, it's like 72% of Americans that you know, feel strongly about background check laws, domestic violence legislation, gun trafficking, trying to get them interested in talking to the people that uh, represent them about this, and also voting on the issue. 
then going back to that 80, 83% or whatever it is, if that's the case, then uh, there's sort of this vacuum of interest on that side. Uh, there's a lot of interest on the pro-gun right side. Uh, there's also a lot of money. I know you mentioned at lunch that your, your organization is a $13 million, $14 million organization. You and your spouse don't take any uh, compensation from that organization. But how does $14 million stack up against, you know, what? I mean, this is the brass tax part of it. This is yeah. the part where I, I, I understand why people say it's impossible. Well, yeah, certainly money in politics is a, is a problem. And often where there's more money, you know, there are more votes. And we've seen this over the year, and we've seen, um, you know, we've seen an organization, the National Rifle Association, has done, you know, a fabulous job. You've got to give them a lot of credit since the 1970s, building an enormous amount of support, not only in Washington, D.C., but in state capitals. They operate on a very large budget. They're also an organization of 800 people, um, so they have a lot of overhead. So their, I think their budget's around $200 million a year. Uh, on the other side, we have less money, but we are, we are smarter than they are. <laughs> we're scrappier than they are, and we're on the right side of history. So those things help. But they're on the winning side so far. No, not everywhere. Absolutely not. Well, since we started our organization, we have helped pass 160 pieces of legislation around the country, and we've defeated other pieces of legislation. And in some states, yeah, they'll get that campus carry bill passed in Texas. They've also worked really hard to, this, I think it was in Iowa. Iowa now, one of their bill that they supported was concealed carry for the blind. That's, that's now the law in Iowa. So if you're a blind person, you can carry a gun. That was very important to them. Um, but, you know, we, we, we've helped pass background check laws in a bunch of different states domestic violence legislation, gun trafficking legislation, safe storage. Um, some of this initiates with us. Some of it wouldn't happen without us. So yeah, we win. We also lose. If we're not around to do this, eventually we will. I mean, if there isn't organizations like ours out there you know, fighting to make communities safer, I'll tell you what, eventually we're be, we'll be living in a country where everybody's carrying a gun. And I will guarantee you that that number is going to go from 25 Way north of that, you know, we're, we, there is no reason why we cannot create an environment here where instead of 36,000 people dying a year, where that number is on 100,000. We, we have it in our ability to do that. So what we're trying to do is get that number going in the other direction. And we know that in states that have stronger gun laws, less people die from gun violence. I mean, you look at the state of Massachusetts and Hawaii. It's, a, it's about two to three people per 100,000 per year die from gun violence. You know what that number is in Louisiana? It's 13.9. So the laws do matter. There are a lot of other pieces to those puzzles, though. There's poverty, there's isolation, there's education. There, it's not just about whether right. or not you have a gun in your hand. That's true. And, it's, and this issue affects different communities in different ways. I mean, when you look at an inner city gun problem like the south side of Chicago, I mean, part of their problem is you have, um, you know, a community there of, you know, you know, young minority men who have a hard time finding a job and don't have anything to do and don't have the, they may not have the, uh, the boys and girls club to, to go to and have nobody to associate with and they wind up getting involved in a, in a gang. And that gun violence is different than what you might see in, you know, Mississippi, where you have, you know, the, the five-year-old winds up shooting his two-year-old sister, or vice versa, because of an accident um, that can be prevented. So these things vary differently, but absolutely. I mean, you know, poverty and, you, you know, the ability to, to have a job and a community of people that support you is, is part of this issue as well. Sandy Hook didn't do it. You know, I, I venture to guess a lot of people in the room didn't know who you were talking about when you brought up Christopher Dorner, um, who, who died in, in, or who shot all those people in 2013. Um, I wonder to what extent people are just getting inured to this now, and, and that's a slippery slope that... That's part of it. That's a big problem. I mean, people just get to the point where they just accept it. They accept that, okay, well, yeah, we've got, we've got a lot of advantages here in the United States, and... A disadvantage is, yeah, my teenage, 
you know, son now is more likely to, to die from gun violence than die in a car accident. Those lines actually crossed in 2015. They used to be teenagers were more likely to die in a car accident. But you know what? We make cars safer. You know, we, we, we address, you know, teenage DUI as a serious problem. We've reduced that. You know, seatbelt laws, airbags, you know, all those things we, we, we address. We address kids dying in cars as a public health issue. We don't do a very good job addressing gun violence as a public health issue, largely because Congress does not allow it. You know, Congress does not allow the CDC or the NIH to do much in the way of research into gun violence. And it's thanks to the gun lobby. They don't, wanna, they don't want the research done because they don't like what it's going to show. Getting back to the person who said it's impossible. <laughs> um, I mean, there are so many guns out there now. Some, some guy just killed his wife and somebody else she worked with um, in, in, a, in an adjacent community to Columbus. Uh, he he uh, had, had orders against him to stay away from her. They, they showed up at his apartment and he had dozens and dozens and dozens of guns. Yeah, you can only shoot one at a time, though. Only one at a time, but what that tells me is he's a guy that shouldn't have had the weapons in right. the first place, and he had dozens and dozens and dozens, and uh, so there's a lot of guns already out there in circulation. You know, what do you do about that? So, That's not going to go away. No, no, and it's, you know, and one of the, the lines the gun lobby uses is the government is going to come and confiscate your guns. Well, really, 350 million guns <laughs> in 65 million places from Key West to Alaska, somebody's gonna come and pick them up? Not happening. I mean, we can barely do a census. I mean, how much do you think 350 million guns weighs? I mean, it probably weighs a billion pounds, right, at least. We're gonna pick this stuff up? No. But here's the other interesting thing about 350 million guns. Half of all the guns are owned by 2% of the gun owners. Right, so that's 175 million are owned by 2% of the people. That's actually a good thing, right? Because those gun owners, those 2%, they're probably very responsible people. So our goal here is, I mean, if a guy, you know, some, I have a buddy in Texas who's a big supporter of our organization who owns 35 guns. It's awesome if he goes by as another 100. It gives people jobs in Connecticut, right? It really does. That's not a problem. The problem is the guy who gets out of the state prison or the county jail who's a felon or somebody who's a domestic abuser and they can go to the gun show and buy a gun without getting a background check. That's where the solution to this lies. That's when I said those numbers, remember, 47% fewer women in states that have universal background checks that have closed that gun show and the internet loophole, 47% fewer women die from gun violence. You know, gun violence, this is interesting, it affects men and women much differently. You know, when women die from gun violence, it's almost, it's more often than not by somebody they know. And from men, it's almost always a stranger. Totally different effect. So, the, so one of the things that we've been advocating for in Washington, D.C. is a law that would strengthen domestic violence legislation to protect women from gun violence. We're having a hard time finding a Republican co-sponsor for the bill. Uh, just uh, in a few minutes, we're going to move to the audience questions. Um, so get your thinking caps on on that score. And yes, you can ask them about space. But um, uh, just in, in, in closing, um, if Congress, I mean, you're, you're, you can't even get, you know, Congress is reticent, reluctant as it stands now to support legislation that would better protect women in domestic violence situations. Yep, that is true. Okay, I'm bringing out the guy who said this is impossible. Mm -hmm. I mean, if- it's Some and, guy and you all know. This Everyone guy, in here knows this person. We know this guy. But you've also got a, a you know, it's completely controlled by Republicans. Uh, Republican president who has, was very, you know, vociferously told the NRA uh, during the campaign that he was with them and with the Second Amendment and blah, blah, blah. So. Where's the, where do you get a foothold right now? These guys, you know, Congress, any Congress is there for two years. The president's there for four years. You know, we, we're going to try, we're going to work hard to pr try to prevent three things from happen, happening. 
concealed carry reciprocity, which means anybody who can carry a gun in any state can bring it to any other state. Silencers being made very easy to buy. And then their third priority is trying to get rid of gun-free zones in public schools. So if all three of these things pass, remember the guy that, that killed Trayvon Martin, George Zimmerman? I believe if all three of those bills were to pass and our president signed them into law, then George Zimmerman can come to Ohio with his gun, put a silencer on it, and walk into one of your public schools. So those are the three pieces of legislation we're really focused on defeating. So that's our job right now. You know, with a different Congress two years from now, um, you know, we'll have other opportunities. Is, is it, I, I, like, I have one more question. Um, is, there's a lot of power concentrated in the NRA. That's not necessarily the case when it comes to organizations like yours. There are s several, you know, they're yeah. out there. No, there, there are other organizations like the National Rifle Association, Gun Owners of America, there are, all, there are all kinds. It's just that the NRA is such a large organization and has been really successful at what they've done. That's why that's well, the one people naturally think about. You only pulled out the terrorism card once. They do it all the time. Yeah, they do it in a different way, though, a way that doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Um, so currently, under federal law, if, you're, if you are a sus suspected terrorist in the United States, um, to the point where you're on the no-fly list and you can't get on an airplane, you could still go to Walmart here in Ohio and buy 10 guns if you want. Not illegally. You'll pass the background check. We're trying to make, put those people on the prohibited purchaser list so they wouldn't be able to pass the background check. At least force them to, to go to the gun show. You know, we're trying to close that loophole too, but you know, there's steps involved in doing this. But suspected terrorists can legally buy firearms in the United States. And how do you uh, that, that's that the the mountain you have to climb in changing people's perception of gun rights laws from something I don't know why I'm straightening this out right now. I'm thinking I guess um, the the changing people's minds about going to the poll to vote on that issue. As I mentioned earlier, that's what gun rights advocates do, is that's why they vote. It's very concentrated, again, it's why they go. Well, if you're interested in making Ohio a safer place, I just challenge you to do this. Just find out, you know, what your, the person you're voting for, at least what, he, what his views are on this issue. That helps a lot. I mean, just, just educate yourself to that point, and then you can make, you know, a more logical decision. It's CMC's tradition to take audience questions. Please state your name, ask your question, and we thank you in advance for not making long editorial remarks. Um, first question, please. Thank you, Ann. Uh, Chuck Taylor, uh, any aspect of your organization to help gun owners be more responsible at home? I saw a nightly news report the other night about the number of kids that get accidentally shot in the home. Like 20 kids a day go to the hospital for accidental shooting? Yeah, you know who are, who's more dangerous in our country with guns and t than terrorists right now? It's toddlers. Toddlers are pretty dangerous. You know, they're killing like a person a week. Um, because a lot of people, you know, gun owners just don't lock up their firearms, leave them loaded with a round in the chamber. And it's a recipe for a disaster around a little kid. Um, so we have looked at that. It's something I would like to do at some point. There are some great organizations that, you know, that, that buy an enormous amount of trigger locks and distribute them. Uh, you know, some places they do this through pediatricians' offices. You know, we had a success here recently in Florida until about, I mean, this, there was a challenge to this law. So in Florida last year and for the previous five years, a pediatrician was not allowed to ask a parent if there was a gun in the house. In Florida, typically what would happen is that if the pediatrician said, you know, he would say, is there a gun in the house? And if the answer was yes, okay, where do you keep it? Do you keep it around in the chamber? Do you keep a trigger lock on it? Do you keep it in the safe? Well, there was a NRA-supported bill that made that illegal for doctors to ask that question of parents. Um, a court found that uh, unconstitutional. 
And so that's been undone. But yeah, we need to do a better job at that, and we're going to continue to look at it. Hi, my name's Trip Lazarus. Um, my question is about if, the, if we have great support um, among people, 80% or so, for common sense uh, legislation, Ohio has the path of constitutional amendment where the voters can vote on a single issue and, uh, and overtake uh, what the legislature won't do for them. Um, and that path has been used a lot. Maybe it's not the best legislative path, but um, it's a way for the citizens to get things done when the legislature won't act. What do you think about that? You know, yeah, so I we've been involved in that, you know, ballot initiatives in Oregon, the state of Washington, Nevada, Maine, California. We've looked at other places, but Ohio is a state where that has a history of being successful. So that is an option here in Ohio. Good afternoon. I'm Kathy Fox. Um, uh, one of the arguments I read a lot about um, any kind of gun legislation is that it's a slippery slope yeah. and that if you take small steps that restrict people's rights that um, it will quickly snowball into taking away constitutional rights. How do you respond to that? Well, so, I mean, just let's look at Washington, D.C. over the last 10 years. Why would anybody think anything is a slippery slope. I mean, it's impossible for us to do anything. I mean, I think if you, I mean, you propose a bill to like, let's do something good for puppies, and you'd have a hard time getting that passed. I mean, so I don't buy the slippery slope argument, if anything, coming from somebody from my former background, the slope is made out of Velcro. Hi. My name's Marie Trudeau with W.E. Davis Insurance. Thank you for being here, and I give my best to Gabby. I'm disappointed I don't get to see her. She's one of my heroes. Um, uh, my question is, is, you could pass laws, but we're concerned about criminals getting guns. Criminals, in general, don't obey laws by nature. So how, how, is the legislation, how would legislation help with that segment of the population? Well, that, that's, the, that's the NRA's argument. That's the, what the gun lobby often says. So let me ask you this. If we didn't have a law in this country against murder, do you think we'd have more murders or less murders? Right? I mean, if it was, if murder was legal or if robbery, if, if it was legal for you to take your neighbor's crap out of his backyard if you wanted his stuff or go into his house and take his money, do you think we'd have more robberies? Of course we would. Right? Um, so laws do matter. Um, we're not going to stop, we're not going to take this number from 36,000, I will promise you this, and get it to go anywhere near zero. That is not going to happen. But I think there's a chance, with a lot of hard work over a period of time, that number can go from 36,000 to maybe 18,000 a year. That's possible. And sure, you're going to have criminals that are going to be really motivated to go find a gun, but why do we make it easy for them? You know, the head of the NRA often says, well, he's just going to go on the black market and get it. Okay, well, I would challenge any of you in here today. I mean, I would, you know, I can hand, every, you know, the first person that can walk out there and, and I'll give you an hour to go out and try to find this black market to go find a gun. You know, here's 500 bucks. You know what's likely to happen if you find the guy? Probably get your ass kicked and your $500 stolen. <laughs> and he keeps the gun. Right, so it's it's it makes it it makes it a lot harder if we make if we close the loopholes that make it easy for you know criminals to buy guns. Renee yeah. Delane from Women Who Dare, Captain Kelly. Often we hear this argument, and you just uh, referenced it earlier, that uh, th that comments about guns that they're coming to get all your guns. Why don't we use that? in the opposite direction against them. Why can't we get that? We heard everybody laughing and saying, and we said how many guns there were would take forever. Why can't we turn that around and use it against that? Well, I asked that question of the President of the United States at a CNN town hall. I got the last question. This was a, a year and a half ago in January. And I said, okay, Mr. President, since they say you're gonna confiscate everybody's guns, I want you to tell me if you were gonna do this, how would you pick up 350 million guns 
in 65 million places from Key West to Alaska. How would you do that? And he, 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 he laughed, as you might expect. He had a good laugh because that's impossible. And then he said, you know, but, you know, it's one of these, like, conspiracy theories that people believe. And then, and then uh, Anderson Cooper said to him, said, well, well, Mr. President, if, if people really believe it, it's not a conspiracy, is it? And the, and the president said to him, well, Cooper, yes, it is. <laughs> this is funny. And later, Anderson Cooper told me, uh, out in the hallway later, he said, you know, I felt like I was back in the fifth grade. <laughs> people telling me, Cooper, his teacher. So, um, yeah, I mean, I talk about it on TV, and I, you know, we talk about it you know, in, in places like this. But sometimes logic, I mean, logically, you think about it. Well, logic doesn't, doesn't always matter in certain places in our society. Hi. Tony Baker, Ohio State Director for Sandy Hook Promise. You mentioned the other states where there were ballot initiatives during the last election. What lessons did you learn from those initiatives, and what did you hear on the ground while you were in those states? Yeah, so we have, uh, you know, supported and helped and, you know, worked on ballot initiatives in, in other, other places. I would think the biggest lesson we learned is be careful who writes the piece of legislation, the language on the ballot, because the language can sometimes torpedo your efforts. You spend a lot of time and effort and money to do some of these things, and a word here and there can mess it up. So I would say the biggest lesson for us, and this is kind of technical thing, but find something that works and then try to repeat it somewhere else. Uh, thanks, Mark Barbash. Thanks so much for being here. Really appreciate it. Um, an observation and then a question. My observation is that we keep saying, what are you going to do about it? And this sounds like a lot of other issues that translates into what are we going to do about it? And it's going to be incumbent on us to treat this issue more seriously. Thanks for permission to ask a space question. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, I noticed that NASA is announcing a uh, mission to the sun. Uh, I presume you're not going to sign up for that one. <laughs> but I'm, I'm, I'm really interested in where you think the space program is now and where it's likely to go in the next, uh, in the next uh, decade or two. Yeah, Katie mentioned that mission to the sun to me in the car driving over here. I'm like, I don't know anything about that. <laughs> you know, we're all going around the sun all the time, right? <laughs> um, you know, I think we're in a pretty good place right now. I mean, people think NASA has shut its doors and... I, a lot of people think NASA is like closed for business. You know, we were t I was the last commander of Space Shuttle Endeavor, so it was the second to last flight of Endeavor. It's in a museum, Discovery's in a museum, Atlantis. We're trying to move on to build safer spacecraft on safer rockets. You know, the odd thing about the Space Shuttle is your spaceship was sitting on the side of your rocket ship. Generally not a good idea. It's better to be at the top and have an ability to get off. So. So we're, uh, SpaceX is building us a spacecraft and a rocket that they've already you know, flown a bunch of times with cargo. Boeing's doing the same thing. Uh, we're doing it a little bit differently than we've done before with uh, not the big giant government contract. We're trying to drive the cost down. I think it's an exciting time for the space program. You know, hopefully we'll get to the point uh, where you know, we, just, we make a decision, and we've kind of made this decision that we want to send you know, people to Mars someday. NASA has a goal in the 2030s. Elon Musk, the CEO of SpaceX and Tesla, he wants to do this in about 10 years from now. Seems kind of impossible, but if there's anybody I think that has the ability to do this, probably him, you know, to do this as a private individual. The rocket science part, we kind of know what we need to know anyway. Um, physiology, we're figuring that out. My brother stayed in space for a year to help support our long-term plan to go to Mars, you know, because these missions are going to be long, probably two and a half years to go there, spend some time there, and come back. The part we haven't figured out, as you might expect, is the political science. That's the hard part, you know, getting not, not only the American people behind it, but then Congress and a president all uh, going down that road. So I'd like to see it in my lifetime. I think. I think the first person to walk on Mars is, is alive today. I'm pretty convinced of that. And it might not be a little kid either. It might be somebody in their 20s or 30s. So. Back to uh, responsible gun ownership and 
um, logic. It, it seems as though you, we have to have a license to drive a car, to own a dog, to go fishing. Is there any initiative to own, not just a permit, but a license to buy a gun that would come with the background check? I'm always curious, it seems like the background check, the onus is on the person selling the gun, not on the person buying the gun, and that seems backwards with everything else that we do in society. Those are generally state laws, and in some state you have to get a, like a permit to purchase card which requires a background check, and then you have this card, and then you're free to go in there and buy you know, whatever gun you want. So that is the law in some states. Uh, the federal law is um, that you just have to do, well, for a handgun, you have to be a resident of the state that you're buying the gun in. Uh, for, that's not true for a, a long gun, a rifle. Um, but you have to get a background check. That's the federal law. I mean, could we change it to the point where there's a more extensive background check required. Like currently, remember I mentioned the silencers? If you really want a silencer and you're a responsible person, you can get one. And people do all the time. You get fingerprinted, you get your photographs, you get photographed, you get a more an extensive background check. There's a little bit of a waiting period. Waiting period's probably too long. There's a fee you pay, you get your silencer. Um, but we're trying to close the loophole to require background checks for all gun sales. That's the first step. And I think if we do that, we'll get these, the, we'll get to where, you know, it's not 47% worse in the state without the background check law. You know, it, it comes more of a norm and uniform across this country. If we do that, we'll save thousands upon thousands of lives every year. Hi, thank you. Thank you so much for being here today. Um, I have kind of a space and a current events question. Mm -hmm. Awful lot of conversation about Russia and how they're not our friends, uh, but NASA and the space program have coordinated with them for years. Do they, do you have, does NASA have a back channel communication with Russia? How, how, how does that work? <laughs> yeah, I could say, you know, one of the guys I went in space with, you know, once a good friend of mine, Sergey Volkov, I had sent him an email. That'd be my back channel, to, you know, to him. Yeah. Um, yeah, we've got a good relationship with them, um, especially on the astronaut and cosmonaut level. Um, I think you go pretty, you go further up in the food chain. You know, sometimes there's um, tension with the Russian Space Agency and NASA. You know, the Russians are, you know, they've got, you know, they'll they'll make comments about. Look, we have no capability to get to the space station right now, and we start saying something. They'll say, one, the head of RSA about a year and a half ago said, well, I don't care. You guys can get to the space station on a trampoline for all I'm, I care, you know. So, but at the, at the cosmonaut, astronaut level, we've got a good relationship with them. We've been working together for a long time. I know some of these guys really well. I mean, my brother calls Misha Kornienko, a guy he spent in space with for a year, my brother, this, the two of them, there were other people there coming and going, but it was just the two of them that were there. He calls Misha his, his brother from a Russian mother. <laughs> so, what was the second part of your question? That was All right. Well, thank you, everybody. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Well, I'm sure we all enjoyed today's forum. Uh, just remember, you can always uh, watch all of our programming. It re-airs in a number of places, including Columbus Television, uh, on WOSU through PBS affiliates throughout the state, uh, and the Ohio Channel, as well as the CMC website via YouTube. Let's thank again our sponsors for today, Barbara K. Fergus and Taft, along with our partners at Ohio Coalition for Common Sense. Thank you for your support. And once again, to our speakers, Mark Kelly and Ann Fisher. We'll see you next week. Wonderful job.